through 38. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she heard that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, bought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and wipe them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owned 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which will love him more? Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to her, uh, He said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. This reminded me of Alan's sermon earlier about how people can generally be categorized as the older or the younger brother from the story of the prodigal son. Uh, the pharisaical or older brother type Christians, like Simon, follow the, the clear cut do's and don'ts of God's commandments. So they see themselves as superior over the younger brother type of Christians, like the woman of the city, who have a harder time following the black and white, the black and white rules, though they may have a larger capacity for love, generosity, or forgiveness. But what does Jesus say in the parable he tells Simon? They both owe a debt. Uh, no matter how much that debt may have been, neither of them could ever pay it. It's the debtor whose bank is broken. It's the woman whose heart is broken from whom we see these beautiful snapshot expressions of gratitude within the Bible. The church is made up of broken people, and they are both forgiven an unpayable debt, both the Pharisee, uh, who realizes that he can't follow God's laws perfectly and is baptized, and the sinful woman, who realizes the generosity that she receives in the forgiveness of her huge debt and lets it change her life around entirely. Whether an older brother type or a younger brother type, people are simply broken by sin. However extensive or small the damage may be, it's in the nature of sin that it it breaks people. Uh, it breaks people away from God first, then it breaks them away from each other, and then it breaks people apart inside. We shouldn't think of ourselves as pure, clear glass compared to others when we're all broken, stained glass compared to, compared to Christ. But it is through Jesus that these broken people, whatever our background, are used for the better in the church. As the broken pieces of glass construct the remnants of that window out there, so the broken, repentant hearts construct God's building, the church. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 9 through 13, we read that we are God's building. Uh, according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it, upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. So we have to do our job the best that we can with what we have, whether we have the precious stones or hay or wood or whatever material we have to work with in the metaphor there. Whatever each individual's job is, we have to do it with the best of what we have, whatever our past, whatever our current situation. We all have a job. Uh, 1 Peter 2 says, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This last sentence reiterates how everyone, no matter how large the debt of sin, depends entirely on God's mercy for everything. Once you were not a people, before receiving mercy, but now we are a people, 
together, we are God's people, and we're in this together no matter our age or our color or our past sins. Uh, Jesus also tells the parable of the unforgiving servant. When his master heard how unforgiving the servant was to his fellow servant, he summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your father, or your brother, rather, from your heart. So when we've received such forgiveness from God, how can we deny such forgiveness and understanding from our fellow servants, our brothers and sisters in Christ, whenever they hurt us? So now back to our scripture in First Peter, we see that not only we are being built into a spiritual house, but into a priesthood, uh, a holy priesthood. What kind of jobs are we supposed to be doing with this priesthood to build up the spiritual house? It says we are to offer spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. This is the job of, pray, of priests. What are spiritual sacrifices? Here are a couple of examples. Uh, Psalm 51, 17 says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Romans 2, or 12, verses 1 through 2 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So with contrite hearts turning us from past habits, we are to be different, fulfilling our title as the church, ecclesia, the called out. We are to be called out or to be holy. Be holy, for I am holy. We're supposed to be different from the world we were once part of, First Peter 1.16. Uh, this is what we should, we should strive for in our living sacrifices that we are to offer as priests of God. This context is what brings us to another verse about the church being constructed of many parts. Going from Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, to verses 3 through 8. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as one body, as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving. The one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. cheerfulness. So no one should think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. This reiterates again how sin has damaged us all. This does not mean to think yourself as worthless or worth little, but certainly no one here is worth more than any other person, although we are all worth a lot in God's eyes. No one is perfect, but if Jesus says to love our enemies, how much more must we love and forgive our brethren who are worth no less than ourselves? Even if you are better at one thing than someone else, like showing kindness, maybe, they may be better at you than another thing, like humility. And we don't know exactly how much value God may see exactly in each of those things. Another thing it says here is the members do not all have the same function. And while this is certainly not the case with the window out there, uh, as parts of the body or spiritual house of God, there are those who are gifted to do better jobs of service, exhortation, generosity, mercy, or zeal, while others are more gifted for jobs of teaching or exhortation. These are all qualities that we should strive to have. But we should also strive to be understanding of those who are weaker in one quality than oneself. Alan, Owen, and the other interns who went out for supper uh, Thursday night uh, with Mr. Perry, who Alan has been studying with, and we came to the subject of God and how different people relate to some of his qualities in different ways. Mr. Perry said he's creative-minded. Owen, to me, appears to be more scientific-minded. Would that sound right? And Alan, obviously, is very logical-minded. 
well, all these aspects of personality serve the church better in some ways and worse in others, or not as good in others, not necessarily worse. For just as the body is one and has many members, 1 Corinthians 12, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we, did, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body. But that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So the different parts of the body we read form one whole body and unity. All the different parts of the glass, when it is whole, they support each other. Even when the rock hit that window, the pain didn't entirely fall out because its parts continue to support each other even at this most critical of times. Just think what can be done with the additions of love and of Jesus' aid. The parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we just bestow the greater honor. This makes me think of people with disabilities. They can show us how to overcome immense difficulty or about the elderly. They've been through it all and they can offer indispensable guidance to the younger brethren. Maybe you can think of some other examples. Maybe like the weaker in faith, rather than pointing out the wrongs in someone else, not considering what they may be going through, we should talk to them kindly and offer them help instead. Galatians 6 verses 1 through 3 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. So we see that it doesn't mean to ignore each other's weaknesses. Rather, if one has gotten the log out of his own eye, like in Jesus' parable, then go ahead and help your brother remove the speck from his, if he needs help. Restore him in a spirit of gentleness. And in turn, don't ever be too prideful or too ashamed to ask a fellow member for help to remove your speck or log that's in your eye. This is fulfilling the law of Christ. What else is our duty as Christians but to fulfill his law? Without Christ, we are by nature incomplete or broken. Only through Christ and his church can we help each other become whole again by bearing one another's burdens. Everyone is hurting somehow, sometimes. So be kind and loving and forgiving. After all, back to what we read in 1 Corinthians 12, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. When that rock hit the window, most of the pain was instantly damaged. But the, major the majority of the damage was concentrated around the point of contact. However, it very quickly extended to every corner of the glass, and more cracks continued to form for hours afterward. What hurts one part of the glass, what hurts one member of the church, affects the rest in some form or another. But if the whole pain is strong, all the parts benefit from each other's strengths. Additionally, Paul says, if one member is honored, all rejoice together. So if something good happens to someone else instead of to you, rather than envy them, we should celebrate with them. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice, James 3, verse 16. So how can a huge, complex structure made entirely of broken parts last for very long? Well, obviously that window out there is not going to last too long, it's about to fall out any time. But the church is different. The church operates with Jesus Christ as the head of the body, binding everyone together in unity and in love. Ephesians 5.23 and Galatians 3.28. Broken people will make up a, break, a broken whole, made special only by Jesus' sanctification of it. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It says, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. 
Now, I've, he- I've heard far too many stories about people who have left the church or even left Christianity because of the wrongdoings or hypocrisies of a fellow church member. While the- whatever those people did was not okay, one should not, and I urge that none of y'all ever leave Jesus or the community for which he died, Acts 20, verse 28, because of the actions of flawed humans. This is precisely the kind of thing that can be avoided if we would be different from the world and from the way we once were as we're called to be. I've heard the church called a hospital for souls. We're all sick and trying to get better. Jesus the great physician is the one who justifies us, not by the power of each other or of our own actions. We are simply the instruments that he uses to heal each other, but all the credit goes to him. Broken people make up a a broken whole and a broken whole cannot function properly, except that with the interference of Christ, he can use it as effectively, as effectively as he needs it for his purpose. So, ended up just with kind of nine random points here and there. We each have to do our job with the best of what we have, and when we've received such forgiveness from God as he's given us, how can we deny such forgiveness and understanding from our fellow servants when they hurt us? And with contrite hearts turning us from past habits, we are to be different, fulfilling our title as the church. No one should think of himself more highly as he ought to think, but with sober judgment. We should strive to be understanding of those who are weaker in one quality than oneself, because all aspects of of personalities serve the church better in some ways and maybe not so much in others. Because of that, we are to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, and not ever be too prideful or ashamed to ask a fellow, a fellow member for help, for help in removing our, the speck or the log in our eye. What hurts one member of the church affects the rest in some form. If something good happens to someone else instead of you, we should celebrate with them rather than envy them. And one should not leave Jesus or the community for which he died because of the actions of flawed humans. So if you still need to be justified, Jesus, he can cleanse you through baptism. And if you've been unfaithful, and you realize you need to change, Psalm 34, verse 18 says, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. So if you need to be baptized or if you've been unfaithful, maybe you haven't been strong of a part of the body as you wish you could be, or you haven't been bearing the burdens of your brothers as you know you need to be, or whatever your problems are, maybe you just have a prayer request that you need because we all have things that we struggle with and we all have uh, friends that we care for and whatever the need may be. If you will uh, come to the front as we stand seeing, we will help you with whatever that need is. All right, all three stanzas at 912. Days are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is Jesus today, leave your worry and fear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Amen. Mm-hmm.
prayer but before we do I would like to say that was a uh, very encouraging um, a lesson uh, sometimes we often forget the purpose of the church and how we are to operate within it but um, even though we are all different people we can all have we all share the same Lord that we should all emulate so that was a very encouraging and uplifting lesson uh, thank you for that and now we'll have our closing prayer would you bow with me please Father in heaven, we thank you for this day, for the blessings of life. Father, as the sun shines today, we pray the sun is shining in the church today, and we try to lift one of those burdens. Father, we thank you especially for the joy of having these young people here with us this summer and those in the intern program. We thank you, Rachel, coming this week to join the team, and we pray that you use her in her service as a teacher, community, to bring a light to this church. Father, we thank you for the elders, and we pray that you'd be with us as we make decisions and draw for direction for the young people. We thank you for Alan and his leadership in vocational ministry. Father, we ask you to bless each and every family here today. Help us, Father, to realize that we are able to help. Pray your blessing upon the work in Zimbabwe as we pray for the Shars and offer money this week for them. As we continue to lift them up to you, Father, we pray that you'd lift them up and keep the people in Zimbabwe might be helping with our medical mission work. Thank you, Father, for your blessings. We thank you for the blessings of life itself. Thank you for loving us and caring for us, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.